Thank you for joining us uh, for this special edition. I'm Delano D'Souza. Today, France is pausing to remember 80 years since the landings in Provence, otherwise known as Operation Dragoon. They came more than two months after the Normandy landings in the month of June 1944. Now, the main aim of Operation Dragoon was to open the Second Front and push the German army up north. Now, while the landings in Provence were key to ending the Second World War, the event has been largely overshadowed. We can, uh, we, uh, during... 15, 1944, hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers landed between Toulon and Caen on the French Riviera. Their objective was to recapture the strategic port cities of Toulon and Marseille, which had been occupied by the Nazis, and to back up the Allied troops that had landed in Normandy 70 days earlier. Herbert Robb remembers the day 80 years ago he set foot on this square in Saint Raphael. The landing was a thing of noise, of the cries, advance, advance. Everyone was shouting. It had to be quick. On board the boats, the soldiers had headed towards the unknown, with the terrible losses of the Normandy beach landings hanging over their heads. During this period of waiting on the boat, the head starts thinking. It asks the question, will I last? Some 350,000 troops landed along approximately 100 kilometres of coastline. The Germans were quickly overwhelmed by the scale of the attack. To carry out the landings, the troops had learnt from the failures in Normandy. They were going to rely more on the information provided by the resistance, which had been somewhat neglected in Normandy. Most of the soldiers were unfamiliar with the area. They were part of the Free French Soldiers and came from overseas colonies in Africa, an aspect that is little known to many who visit this memorial museum in Toulon. It is, in fact, quite moving to see that the Senegalese, Tunisians, Moroccans and Algerians sacrifice themselves for the cause. Toulon and Marseille were liberated earlier than planned on the 26th and 28th of August and France was finally among the victors, thanks to its African soldiers. Now joining me on set is Linda Hervier, a journalist and photographer, as well as author of Forgotten, the untold story of D-Day's black uh, heroes. Uh, great to have you here with us. Mm -hmm. I'm also joined on set by France 24's chief uh, foreign editor, Rob Parsons. Linda, let me start with you. Uh, you know, we know the Normandy landings, the D-Day landings. Very, we just had this huge commemoration just a couple of months ago. Uh, why... Is this landing in Provence more low-key, uh, and why do not many people know about it? Yeah, the, the landings in the south of France are not as well known, um, and I think that that's a shame because they had great strategic importance. Uh, later in the war, it was very important to get a landing here in the south of France, to have the line of Allied troops moving up. Um, the landings are more well known in France because this was the operation where we had a significant portion of French troops involved, mostly African troops. Uh, two thirds of the troops here uh, that landed were uh, with the French forces were African. Um, but why is it not as well known? I think because you did not have as strong German resistance uh, like you did in the, the Normandy landings. Uh, Rob, uh, we saw there on our screen images of the French president Emmanuel Macron and behind him, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, former French president, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, who are the, uh, some of the other big names here? Because obviously we're not ha we don't have the US president Joe Biden in attendance, nor Britain's King Charles or any of that. Well, it's nothing on, on the scale of uh, what we saw at the Normandy landings, for, for as you pointed out. Uh, there are uh, presidents from Cameroon, Togo, Central African Republic, Comores, Gabon, and various ministers from countries like Senegal, for instance, which played a, a big part in the, the landings uh, in 1944. Uh, but otherwise, it's on a much lower key, more at ambassadorial level than uh, ministerial or presidential level or prime minister. Uh, and that, I think, to a degree, I mean, first of all, I think the obvious thing that has to be said is that this is the 80th anniversary. It's not the 50th anniversary or the 75th anniversary, which mm. are big dates, obviously. Mm. You, know, you have anniversaries, obviously, every year. But we, uh, to you, be fair, we made a big deal of this year's D-Day commemorations as well. Yes, I mean, but I mean, to, to, to be fair, I think in, in, in terms of its 
impact on the outcome hmm. of the Second World War, D-Day undoubtedly had more significance uh, than Operation Dragoon, although Operation Dragoon was important, but, but it was able to be successful in large part because the D-Day landing sucked away German troops uh, from the shores of the Mediterranean hmm. uh, and left the, the, the landing force, which was substantial. We're talking about 95, almost 94,000 people landing on the first day of the operation. Uh, but they landed, by and large, to beaches which were poorly defended. They suffered a total of just around, around about 395 casualties on the first day. If you compare that with D-Day, mm. where with 10,000 people suffered casualties on the first day, mm. you get an idea of the difference in scale of things. Uh, but it was... As you, as you pointed out, it was very important to creating a second front, mm. uh, which put the Germans in a difficult position and a dilemma about where to distribute their troops uh, and allowed a pincer movement that pushed the Germans back later on. But in terms of, of the operation itself, uh, if you compare it with D-Day, it was much smaller in scale. Uh, Linda, when it came to uh, planning uh, for, for Operation Dragoon, who was more involved in it? Was it uh, the French that played a larger role the French didn't play a larger role in planning. The original plan for Operation Dragoon came, uh, came from General George Marshall in 1942. So this operation was always planned. It was supposed to be simultaneous with the Normandy landing. But why wasn't it? Because the Allies encountered problems when they landed south of Rome in Anzio. And what happened was, because it was more difficult for them to land uh, in Italy to take control of those beaches, Beachheads, they were not sure that they were going to go ahead with the landings in the south of France. Mm. And then after uh, they were able to, to take control, Rome was liberated on June 4th, the decision was made to go ahead with this operation. Another factor too was the fact that the D-Day landings took up so many landing crafts uh, that, the, that the sufficient number weren't available to carry out a simultaneous operation. Mm. But once D-Day had been completed uh, successfully, that freed up landing craft which could be used uh, in the south of France. The, the other issue, too, was Winston Churchill did not want this landing yeah. to happen. Yeah. He wanted to go further east. He wanted a push from Italy up to Central Europe. Uh, the Russian leader, Joseph Stalin, opposed this. He didn't want the Allies anywhere near what he considered his territory. Yeah. And so there was this idea that this would be Operation Anvil in the yeah, South. I mean, there was, I mean, just to follow up what you're saying, it's a really important aspect of this, this operation because it was discussed at Tehran where there were meetings of Roosevelt, Stalin and Churchill. Uh, uh, Churchill, as you, as you said, was absolutely opposed to it uh, because he saw the strategic interest of the Allies of being to press into the Balkans and to Vienna, mm. saying that that would... Otherwise, the Russians would have a free hand in Eastern Europe. And it's interesting that after the war was ended, Churchill continued to make the same argument, supported by many people, incidentally, who felt that the Allies gave the Russians, or the Soviet Union as it was then, pretty much a free path into Central Europe. Mm. And, and if the Allies decided to put the emphasis on the Balkans and Vienna, that might have been prevented. Uh, a question for, for either one of you. Uh, we... Uh in, in history, we, of course, learn a lot about the D-Day landings and we spend a bulk of it. And I went around the newsroom asking <laughs> colleagues who are well-educated, who studied history, if they knew about the landings in uh, Provence, and very few knew. And I asked colleagues on the French service if they learned this in schools and they don't learn as much about it. Uh, is, that, is that surprising, given that we're in France and the... I, I, I think that the epic battles, the Normandy invasions, D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, these are the battles that are in our memory. These are the battles that are commemorated on film uh, and that we remember. We don't remember battles like Dragoon as, mm. as, as much. Also, the story of Dragoon is also the story of colonial soldiers, of African soldiers. L let's talk about that for a second, because uh, the role of France took a while to recognize uh, the service, uh, the sacrifice made by non-white soldiers, essentially. Uh, what do you make of that, uh, either one of you? Well, it was seven decades, in, in fact, till there was some recognition given by France to these soldiers. And the problem with that, of course, is that these soldiers were not only denied credit 
at the time for what they did. They were not only denied glory, they were not allowed to participate in the liberation of Paris on August 25th. They were denied pensions. They were denied citizenship. Mm. Um, and it was very harrowing for the African troops to be part of this this campaign beyond Dragoon, because if they had been captured by Germans, uh, they risked being instantly executed. The, the rules of war did not apply to them. And they'd fought all through Italy as well. Was, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go across to our correspondent, Emerald Maxwell, standing by in the south of France. Emerald, uh, talk us through what's happening where you are. I see it's pretty gloomy there. Is the weather going to cancel anything? Uh, well, so far, so good this morning. Uh, Macron, President, French President Emmanuel Macron, is leading the international ceremony, which is happening here at Boulouris Cemetery, where uh, 464 soldiers from the French Army B are buried. They took part in those landings, those Provence landings, in 1944 and died fighting for France. Uh, they're buried here, and so this is where the commemorations are taking place. Uh, we're expecting, well, in fact, that we've, they've arrived, uh, delegations, uh, leaders of uh, fr former French colonies from Africa, uh, and including Cameroon's Paul Biya, who is expected to give a speech on behalf of all of those uh, African leaders. We're also expecting a speech from Macron, where he is uh, expected to uh, for once, put the, uh, single out the importance, the central role that these colonial uh, subjects, these colonial soldiers played in, uh, the, these, in the French army in, the, in these landings, uh, which was in, just as vital in, in a lot of ways as the D-Day landings, which uh, overshadow it. Uh, we're also, we also have some veterans present, uh, some from Senegal, the Senegalese tirailleurs, the riflemen, uh, we have some from there, but also some from France and other allied countries, because, of course, it was the Americans that led uh, the, the charge um, of the Provence landings. They landed first on the 15th of August, followed by the French the following day, who uh, then they had split up and they had different objectives. Um, and uh, so we have re representatives from those allied countries, uh, some ambassadors and uh, ministers. Um, and uh, the French president is also expected to bestow the Légion d'honneur, which is France's highest, highest honor, on six veterans who were in, who fought in World War II. Five of them are French and one of them is foreign. Emerald, uh I was in my research for uh, today's uh, show. I, I, th there's a lot of literature that says this, these landings in Provence were key to ending World War II. Uh, given that, why are the, why does it, uh, you know, so, sort of, uh, why do the Normandy landings tend to overshow what happened in Provence? Overshadow, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's true. The Normandy D-Day landings have really eclipsed uh, these Provence landings, which are, have been largely forgotten. Um, there are several reasons, potential reasons for this. Maybe because it was easier than expected. The Allies accomplished their goals a lot faster. They were met with less resistance, le less, much less German resistance. It was a much less tough battle than the Normandy D-Day landings, which really captured the public imagination, which were very publicized uh, within uh, just by the, by the 28th of August, the French troops had uh, recaptured the ports of Toulon and Marseille, and most of southern France was liberated uh, by the Allies um, in just four weeks. So that's one reason, perhaps. Uh, it was obviously a lot less deadly as well. They lost 1,000 troops uh, compared to 10,000 in the D-Day landings in those initial days. Um, but also, perhaps because the uncomfortable fact that the French attack relied so heavily on its colonised subjects, um, and in the context of decolonisation, it's not a... It's an, it's an uncomfortable thing for, for the, for, was an uncomfortable thing for decades for the French who uh, for decades tried to whitewash or you know, raise the role of these soldiers who came from all over uh, the French uh, empire at the time, uh, particularly from its African colonies. They made up uh, the majority of that of armée B in the, in the, in the landings. Um, and in the last couple of decades, there have been efforts to remedy that and give them uh, the, more, the importance they deserve, this, the, the, what they what show that they really they died for France despite sometimes being conscripted and you know fighting in a war that had really had very little to do with them. Uh, now there's efforts to uh, bring remedy that and give them the place they deserve, as well as to remember uh, the place that uh, the Provence landings have in history as well. Emerald, uh, thank you very much for that. Emerald Maxwell, uh, 
we'll be checking in with her uh, throughout. Now, 100,000 Allied troops landed on the beaches of the French Riviera on the 15th of August, 1944. In the weeks uh, after, uh, in the weeks uh, the, bet after the landings, uh, between 200 to 250,000 soldiers were used in the operation, and they mainly came from French overseas territories, but it took decades for post-war France to highlight the crucial role of non-white soldiers in the fighting. Caitlin Kelly reports. A victory for the French, only possible with the support of its colonies. A quarter of a million soldiers from countries like Algeria and Morocco joined Allied forces for the Provence landings, including the Senegalese Tirailleurs, an infantry in the French army recruited from primarily West Africa. Some who've travelled to the Riviera to commemorate 1944. If France has been able to write liberty, equality, fraternity under its flag. It is partly thanks to the Senegalese infantrymen who made sacrifices that were very important for France's freedom. Codenamed Operation Dragoon, the beach landings in the VAR region led to the recapture of key port cities like Marseille and Toulon from the German occupiers. But it took decades for post-war France to highlight the role of soldiers from its colonies. France. France had forgotten about us, but they're making up for that now. So we hope that this will continue for our children in the future. President Macron is expected to single out the contribution of the soldiers often forcibly recruited from the French colonies. Remembering and talking about France's colonial history should really be public policy and should be accompanied by major commemorations like those for the 80th anniversary of the Provence landings. But also by events, conferences, symposiums that will enable the French society as a whole to better understand this history. I'd like to bring in our guests on set, uh, France 24's chief foreign editor Rob Parsons, as well as uh, Linda Hervier, journalist and uh, photographer. She's also the author of Forgotten, the untold story of uh, D-Day's uh, Black Heroes. Uh, in that uh, story there, which we played, uh, we it sort of took France a long time to recognize the importance and the role played of soldiers coming from former colonies or colonies at the time. Uh, is that similar or different to what we saw when it came to the treatment of, uh, of the recognition of African-American soldiers? Absolutely. The story of racism and discrimination in military history goes far beyond France. The Americans uh, patented it from the revolution forward. And uh, in World War II, we saw black troops uh, from the US relegated to service and labor battalions, uh, responsibility taken away from them uh, from earlier wars where they had shown great uh, bravery. And it was also a struggle uh, for the Americans to get credit for what they did. And African Americans would not see the medals they deserved and the opportunities they deserved in the military until years after World War II. Uh, Rob, uh, t uh, 10 years ago, France commemorated this event uh, for the 70th, of course, anniversary of the landings in Provence. There were a lot more African heads of state president, present than there, there are today. France's relationship with its former colonies has changed dramatically in the past decade, hasn't it? It has, yeah. I mean, we, as, as we were saying a moment or two ago, I mean, you, anniversaries by definition come around every year. You're not going to have a grandiose event on every occasion. The 75th anniversary was a big one. Uh, I'm sure the 100th will be even bigger. But yes, yeah, so there's no question that in, in the, the last few years or so, the relationship between France and uh, the African states that were once its colonies mm. uh, has been a fraught one. Uh, and France has been trying to readjust. If you go, go back to the days even of Sarkozy, you know, he was trying to re readjust the, the, the nature of the relationship between France and its former colonies, trying to get away from that notion of France-Afrique, uh, and struggling. And we, we've seen this President Macron attempt to accelerate things, to make it a, a more equal relationship. But we've seen in recent years with you know, the expulsion of French troops from uh, Central Africa, fr from Niger, from Burkina Faso. Mali. You know, just how complicated, how difficult that relationship is for France. 
Indeed, and uh, we, I, I, I've noticed here we don't even have uh, Francois Hollande, who's present. Have you seen him? The I haven't French seen president? him. Yeah, I've been Sarkozy as so. well. I saw Sarkozy there as well as the French uh, defence uh, minister. Uh, Linda, let's talk about uh, in terms of uh, educating the public of this uh, important event uh, in terms of in university curriculums or what have you, because it's, it seems that this, of course, tends to get overshadowed by uh, the the Normandy landings, which is obviously where, you, as you mentioned, where most more lives were lost. Mm -hmm. well, the story of race in in war and race in the military goes far beyond military history. This is a history that is very much woven into the fabric of the history of the United States of France. Um, it's a, it's a world history. And the problem is, who are the historians who tell the story? Hmm. Why do we not know about the story of the Senegalese terreur, the massacres that happened in France of these French troops of color? Hmm. Why do we not know this story? Why do we not know the story of African Americans in the military? Hmm. The only way we can do this is, is if there is a concerted effort to teach this. And there, as far as I can tell, is not. I think, I think we're better, but we're, we're not there. I interesting uh, point uh, you raised, uh, basically, who is telling the story, essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about uh, today's events, because as you said, Rob, uh, the, the next commemoration, probably in 100 years, uh, will probably be a bigger one than this. But this is probably the last one where we're going to have veterans uh, in attendance. Same, That's true. <laughs> same story as we did just a couple of months ago for D-Day. Yeah. Uh, and that, uh, let's talk about the, the French president, because he wants to bestow honors on certain Senegalese soldiers. But even with that, there's been a rift with uh, Senegal on over how many and how many soldiers lost their lives uh, for France, because not everyone can sort of agree to w with what happened uh, uh, back 80 years ago. That's certainly the, the case. I think a big problem is, in terms of, if we're speaking about Operation Dragoon and why do we not know the glory of it, why do we not know the achievements of 80% of the fighting force being troops of color, we saw an immediate whitewashing of this story. Did you see black soldiers in the liberation of Paris, those famous pictures? You did not, mm. because General de Gaulle did not want them there. Also, the Americans did not want the African Americans there. So we did not see these faces. So instantly, we have the record washed clean mm. of some of the most important Why people Why do you think there. that is? Um, well, we know from General de Gaulle that he very much wanted the liberation of Paris to be a white French story after the humiliation of 1940, when France fell so quickly mm. to the Germans. And so de Gaulle absolutely did not want those colonial troops there. There were 5,000 African troops in occupied Paris, but we saw you know, there's a famous photo of one of these troops photobombing General de Gaulle um, that, that is really an emblematic photo of that campaign to keep the liberation white and to have the glory go to white soldiers with the idea that we want to make sure that the French know that it's white French soldiers uh, who were humiliated in 1940, who then now in August of 1944 are the victors. Mm. Uh, Rob, uh, let's talk about um, uh, you know the, the, this commemoration today and the importance of it because. Uh, Clearly, it's 80 years. This is the last time we're going to have veterans in attendance. Uh, France has obviously extended invitations to a lot of African heads of state. We only have, what is it, one African president who is in attendance. We have Paul Bier, who is set to deliver remarks. Uh, no, there are a few more than that. A few more than that. Yeah. But again, we, it's not the kind of uh, commemoration we saw just a couple of months ago for D-Day in terms of uh, honoring the sacrifices made from its former colonies. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely the case. And you know, I think everything that we've been saying up until now has to be fed into that. What, if we try to understand why, why it's happening this way and not the way it happened at D-Day. Mm. Um, but yes, you know, there's a, I think there is a greater understanding on the part of the French state now that the participation and role of uh, black African troops uh, at the end of the Second World War was substantial and important. Just in the 
the case of this operation, Operation Dragoon, uh, the, the seizure, the recapture of Toulon and Marseille from the, from, from the Germans was largely carried out through the participation of those troops. And this, I think, sort of retrospectively is an attempt to try and uh, address that uh, and accept the role of uh, Africans from Senegal, from Morocco, from uh, Mauritania, Algeria, you know, they played a really substantial mm. ro role in, in, that, in those battles. And then on from there, going up uh, through the Rhone Valley, up, up to Dijon, where the, the, the Germans entrenched themselves uh, after their long retreat. There is, I think, an attempt now to, to, to readdress that uh, and to accept that the role of the African soldiers was very substantial. Uh, I see uh, Cameroon's President Paul Bia is being greeted by uh, French President uh, Emmanuel Macron there. Uh, in the south of France, uh, those uh, commemoration uh, ceremonies are due to kick off in uh, just a couple of minutes' time. But uh, before uh, we get to that, just a uh, next report here on why uh, the landings in Provence, which were uh, key to ending the Second World War, have, uh, were largely overshadowed by the landings in Normandy. Eliza Herbert has a story. On August 15, 1944, hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers landed between Toulon and Cannes on the French Riviera. Their objective was to recapture the strategic port cities of Toulon and Marseille, which had been occupied by the Nazis, and to back up the Allied troops that had landed in Normandy 70 days earlier. Herbert Robb remembers the day 80 years ago he set foot on this square in Saint Raphael. The landing was a thing of noise of the cries, advance, advance. Everyone was shouting. It had to be quick. On board the boats, the soldiers had headed towards the unknown, with the terrible losses of the Normandy beach landings hanging over their heads. During this period of waiting on the boat, the head starts thinking. It asks the question, will I last? Some 350,000 troops landed along approximately 100 kilometres of coastline. The Germans were quickly overwhelmed by the scale of the attack. To carry out the landings, the troops had learnt from the failures in Normandy. They were going to rely more on the information provided by the resistance, which had been somewhat neglected in Normandy. Most of the soldiers were unfamiliar with the area. They were part of the Free French Soldiers and came from overseas colonies in Africa an aspect that is little known to many who visit this memorial museum in Toulon. It is, in fact, quite moving to see that the Senegalese, Tunisians, Moroccans and Algerians sacrifice themselves for the cause. Toulon and Marseille were liberated earlier than planned on the 26th and 28th of August, and France was finally among the victors, thanks to its African soldiers. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring in our uh, guests once again, Lena, uh, Linda. Sorry, we were, we were talking on set about how uh, the the ports of Marseille and Toulon, uh, after the, the landings in Provence, fell pretty quickly. Uh, why why was that? Was were the Germans so not prepared? The German resistance at this point uh, that were defending those beaches and that coastline was, was weak. There was one uh, panzer tank division that was uh, seen as qualified, but the others were uh, called volunteers. So that, that probably means the Eastern Europe conscripts and others uh, who were not up to the job of defending that coastline. Remember, after Normandy, a lot of the German resources were taken to, um, to push the Allies uh, back, which they, they failed. And so the Germans were su substantially weakened by the time these landings happened uh, today, on August 15th. Uh, I guess uh, those uh, images you see on your screen there are of veterans, uh, the, the, obviously the image changed now, uh, who had fought uh, during uh, this operation. Um, Rob, uh, we haven't spoken about this yet, but the role of the French resistance uh, during uh, Operation Dragoon, what do we know? Yeah, I mean, it was very substantial. The, the, the French resistance had been getting stronger uh, in, in the months before the, the operation, obviously much encouraged, encouraged by what was happening further north in, in Normandy. And they were getting themselves organized and in preparation because they knew something was coming. Uh, uh, and w when it happened, they, together with 
uh, commandos that were dropped, uh, put in, in, into the southern France by the Allies and paratroopers uh, the day before the operation began. The French resistance, uh, the French forces of the interior, as they were called, played a substantial role in harrying the, the, the German rear. Uh, in destroying bridges and lines of communication. And then when the Germans started retreating up the Rhone Valley towards uh, first Montélimar and then Dijon, mm. they harassed the Germans all the way up on the, on the way. So they played a very considerable role, uh, together with those that landed on the coast, uh, in ensuring the German defeat and forcing them into a headlong retreat. Uh, and, of course, there's uh, the question of secrecy in terms of planning uh, an operation like this. Same with D-Day. Um, Linda, th there was a code message uh, which the BBC broadcast uh, to get this uh, plan into motion. Do you know what it is? I don't. I have it. <laughs> I was I telling Rob about it earlier. It's super interesting. It's, yeah. Nancy, have a stiff neck. Okay. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, we when we... When I... After D-Day, there were so many documentaries about um, the planning uh, an operation like this takes. Uh, months and months of planning, years of planning, essentially. Yeah. And, of course, the secrecy to, to, to make sure no one knows about it and the Germans can't find out about it and crack any codes. It's impressive. It's well, the scale of the operation was massive. I mean, we said 95,000 troops landed on the first on day. On a single day, yeah. On a single day. You know, D-Day was bigger, but not massively bigger. Yeah. I think it was about 150,000 on the first day in D-Day. Over 2,000 ships were involved mm. uh, in landing the troops of various different kinds, some as landing boats, some as uh, pr uh, providing cover fire so that the troops could land to suppress German mm. artillery positions and so on. Over 3,000 aircraft, you know, mm. bombers coming in to attack German positions to destroy their lines of communication. Mm. Uh, if so the coordination, if you think about it, the logistics involved, mm. you know, these ships didn't just sort of pop out of nowhere. They had to be brought from all over the Mediterranean. So there were ships coming from Algeria, from Morocco, uh, from the southern tip of Italy, up to Corsica, and then coming together for that landing. It was an, an immense logistical operation. It's pretty impressive. And I just, uh, one wonders if... if D-Day and the landings in Provence had happened at the same time, what would have realistically changed? What outcome, uh, what could have been different? Because it seemed that things happened pretty quickly after uh, the, both the D-Day landings and then the landings in, in Provence. Because Yeah, that's a very good question, because certainly the German forces would have been uh, stronger in Provence um, at that time. Um, also, remember that for this operation, it went very much in a D-Day amphibious invasion fashion. So first you had um, a neutralization, a landing on the coastal islands to get rid of any threat there. Then you had the paratroopers, the airborne gliders came in. Then you had bombing. Um, and then with the idea of um, being behind the German forces to um, stop them retreating. And then you had the uh, amphibious invasion, the landings. And so very much went according to a D-Day playbook. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think what might have, we're just surmising here, yeah. of course, but you know, if the operations had been simultaneous, then the landings in Normandy could probably have been affected with less cost. Mm. Uh, because a lot of German resources would have been pulled away to the south as well. You're talking about they, uh, the, 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 hu the civilian toll as well? Well, obviously, yeah, yeah. for everybody, but in particular for the troops landing. Mm. The Germans wouldn't have been able to concentrate so much firepower and so, and so many troops in the northwest of France as they did uh, when the Normandy landings happened, because they would have been forced to uh, move some of their troops at least to the south, and they wouldn't have been able to pull the resources that they did from the south up to the northwest when the Normandy landings happened. So uh, we're surmising, but I imagine it would have been slightly easier for the Allies uh, in the north if that had happened. But as I was saying earlier on, you know, they didn't have sufficient uh, landing craft mm. uh, and res other resources to make that possible, which is why they delayed it. That's true. Uh, we see images of our screen of the French President Emmanuel Macron, who is uh, looking on as uh, we have um, uh, commandos uh, sing. Uh, let's take a listen to uh, that. Sans pitié, tu défends ton drapeau. Modèle de cause et de toi, que 
Okay, uh, that was uh, the choir of the French army uh, singing uh, the commandos of Africa. Rob or Linda, it seems that D-Day more or less pays tribute to the sac sacrifices of American soldiers because so many Americans died during D-Day. And this event, of course, paying tribute to the sacrifices made by uh, soldiers from uh, mainly Africa and, and French uh, colonies at the time. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure you can say that the that the memorials in the north of France were primarily or exclusively for Americans. Not exclusively, were, but there, I mean, was there were yeah, no, British thousands Canadians of British and, yeah. Canadians and uh, Poles lost their lives there as well, and their their contribution is commemorated, I think. But yeah, I mean, th what we're seeing today is an attempt, I think, as we were saying earlier on, to redress the balance. You know, the, the, it is a fact that the the contribution of uh, African nations and their soldiers to uh, the defeat of the Germans in the south of France, although it's been acknowledged in the past, hasn't, hasn't really been given its due place. OK, we're going to listen to uh, Paul Bia uh, uh, delivering his remarks there. First of all, I would like to thank President Emmanuel Macron for inviting me here to take part in the 80th anniversary of the Provence landing. I would also like to thank him for the very warm welcome for myself and my delegation. I also salute your presence here, all of you who have come all this way to Inaugurate in 1964 by General de Gaulle, who was then president of the Republic, in the presence of many combatants from France and Africa on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Provence landing. La Nécropole Nationale de Bouloris. The Bouloris Necropolis is full of history. This is a place of remembering, of pain, of taking stock, which calls upon us to think about the future of the world. Many soldiers here in Saint Raphael and in the hinterlands of Provence, as in Normandy and elsewhere in Europe, gave their lives to fight the occupation to save liberty, creating a wonderful chain of solidarity. We are still here today to remember their valor, to remember this war for liberty, and to pay homage heads of state and government, ladies and gentlemen, the thousands of men under leadership of the general de l'Adre de Tassigny fought with courage, and many of them were from the colonial empire of France, who came from sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, and the contribution of Africa was significant to break the German occupation. Une occupation, une occupation 
an occupation destroying liberty. And the troops had been given the order to fight to their very last bullet. Assistance from the free France territories provided major support in this battle. Among others was to raise troops in Africa, considered as a potential base for reconquering Europe, that Colonel Leclerc went to Cameroon. The rallying of Cameroon, one of the very first, was immediately obtained as early as the 27th of August, 1940, which made General de Gaulle say that Cameroon had just made a wonderful decision and are setting a magnificent example. The swiftness of this rallying allowed General de Gaulle to demonstrate to his allies the reality of a combative France. The troops under command of Colonel Leclerc had many men from French Equatorial Africa and Cameroon. It is from Douala that the expeditions departed, which then made up the Leclerc column. The, there are many courageous acts of these soldiers, and they went through Tunisia in 1942, and then through Sicily in Italy, and then Corsica, without omitting Chad. Everywhere where the fighting took them, these valorous soldiers from Africa, from Madagascar, from the Indian Ocean, were magnificently illustrated. They did pay a very heavy tribute for the victory. The combatants were often heirs to memorable warrior traditions with wonderful courage and audacity and loyalty. They were the artisans of victory. Their blood forever mixed with other blood so that France and its allies be definitively covered in glory. In this day of memory, we owe them enormous respect. Heads of state and government, ladies and gentlemen, there would not have been an allied victory without the sacred alliance of the volunteers and the contribution of other peoples, without foreigners, without the tirailleurs, this battle was won altogether in defense of the values and humanist values of justice and peace. This presents a vision of the world and mankind which we share. On behalf of this, together we fought side by side. They were, these legions were respectful of our differences, of the inf infinite diversity of humans, of civilizations, of religions. And this vision within all of us has the, says that we are, all have equal access to dignity. And this battle was a precious lesson that we must perpetuate and transmit to future generations to avoid the errors made in our past. Personally, I have the conviction that international solidarity and better understanding of the interests of other countries, especially in the Global South, would provide more peace in the world today. 
This is also the meaning of our presence here. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are here in Provence to remember a war of the past and to pay homage to the heroes of our history. But the war which we thought forever banished from our territory is once again present in Europe and closer than ever. ever. Once again, men are fighting just a few hours from here. This is to say that international organizations and the systems implemented following the two world wars, especially the Second World War, remain perfectible. Yes, the ghosts of revenge and the flagrant violation of state sovereignty is intolerable. In our daily lives, international law interpreted in various ways, the instrumentalization, the right to forget, or other wars and the permanent willingness to dominate, to exploit, to build a world in one's own advantage are the shadows in which we stand today and which explain our presence here. This commemoration must also highlight our re collective responsibility in preserving peace and liberty in the world. We must find responses to the terror of terrorism, injustice. We must bolster trust in multilateralism to bring to life the concord and make the world safer. Almost everywhere, the major question remains to know whether we should capitulate before the pessimism of the inevitability of war or if we can still build a future full of hope where war would definitively be part of history. Unfortunately, geopolitics, geo World geostrategy, dominated by the race to arms, by the construction of blocks as back. Once again, we see paramilitary militias setting up, being set up. And now war is carried out by proxies. If we do nothing, the world once again is heading for conflict with incalculable consequences. Cameroon has always had recourse to dialogue, to concerted solutions. We have always made the Pacific resolution of differences the key to our undertakings to stop war and strife. Here, I would like to salute the organization of this commemoration, which constitutes an excellent occasion to promote solidarity amongst nations for lasting peace so we can all face the major problems of our times together. Thank you for your kind attention.
You were listening uh, to Cameroon's uh, President uh, Paul Bia delivering remarks on the 80th anniversary of uh, the uh, landings in Provence. There you can see he's speaking to the French President Emmanuel Macron, who's uh, thanking him uh, for his speech, where he did, in Monsieur fact, Emmanuel reference Macron, uh, de la the République. war currently going on here in Europe, uh, of course, making reference to Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Let's take a listen to the French President now. Votre Altesse. Your Highness, Messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Heads of State and Monsieur Government, President, President Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Ladies and Gentlemen, Ministers, Mesdames et Messieurs les ambassadeurs, Ambassadors, Mesdames et Messieurs les parlementaires, Parliamentarians, Monsieur le Président, General, Prefect, Monsieur le Président du Conseil Régional, President of the Regional Monsieur Council, le Président, du Conseil President of the Departmental Monsieur le Maire, Council, Mayor, Mesdames et Messieurs, en Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear veterans, Mesdames et Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, aux premières heures de la in the nuit first du 15 hours of the 15th of August 1944, the Mediterranean coast was still under German occupation. Soudain, Suddenly, au Canadel, le chef in the Canadel, de son sommeil par une voix the war chief was called from his là. slumbers. Who is Mon there? Nadine. He asked, fearing par la that he was going to be arrested by the Gestapo. Through these blinds, he heard the Albert voice Torel. of Albert Torel, the captain, Ouvrez. who answered, Open, it's the African army. The African army. Le chef de gare ouvri, incrédule, the station master opened up. Certes, Deux mois après le débarquement de Normandie, and of course, alors que after les the landing in Normandy, after the catastrophes they had seen, many were expecting an attack of the Allies in Provence to take the ports and take the Germans from behind. And even though it was delayed, Operation Dragoon had been prepared for weeks, thanks to intelligence from the French resistance. It was engaged starting on the 9th of August during the landing of thousands of French, English, American soldiers in Tarente, Oran, Brindisi. And nobody could then doubt that the largest fleet ever seen in the Mediterranean, 2,000 American and British ships, destroyers, troop carriers had assembled off the coasts of Corsica. And of course, in the preceding days, the air raids of the Allies had been so numerous that the churches along the coast, from St. Maxime's to Lavendou, had given up the idea of celebrating the Mass on the 15th of August. However, that night, emotion gripped Captain Durel and the station master. The attack was underway. Une opération en proportions épiques. With epic proportions. 90,000 soldiers de France. Sur ce chapelet de mince landing on the coasts of France de Falaise, in the Calanque. Par dizaines de milliers d'hommes de la Wehrmacht. Cliffs defended by thousands of soldiers from the Wehrmacht. De la nuit to ensure success. Cette poignée the deepest night was essential. Between midnight and dawn, the commandos in charge of destroying the enemy defenses, for them it was the shortest night ever. On the island of Levant, in Porcou, this is where the American and Canadian commandos landed at zero hour, off Cap Negre, where the soldiers had to climb the cliffs to neutralize the German batteries on another beach in Esquillon between Trias and Théoul. The Marines preferred to continue through a field with, filled with mines rather than turn back. On the Alpha beach in the west, Sur les plages du secteur Delta, in the Delta Saint -Maxime, sector in Saint Maxime, the first American divisions landed in France on a beach littered Bientôt, with mines and torpedoes, and then Bunker under bombs, German bombs, and missiles fired by the Germans. 
the landing troops began. An uninterrupted interrupted line of soldiers, machines, battalions, sometimes pushed back in the Fréjus Saint Raphael beaches. The troops had to pull back to then move on to Dramont and Aguet. And then at noon, on the semaphore of Saint Maxime, flew the American flag. Place des Lys. The German soldiers were arrested and surrendered with their hands up. The next day, they rejoined the other troops, the 9,000 American and Canadian troops, landed in an area which had been cleared by the resistance. It was not the same as in Normandy as one of the men of the General de Latre has said, it wasn't the same. Ici, because Provence, here in Provence, 230,000 French armés, soldiers landed, Américains. fully armed and prepared by our American allies. Eux, Spahis, Many of them, Spiley, Goumier, the African tirailleurs, also from the, the West Indies, had never been to France and discovered the red rocks of the coastline. Others had escaped from France, like a sailor who hadn't heard from his family for four years, who went to his house in Saint-Maxime and fell into the arms of his father. Many, like Yorgi Kouli, who was born in Chad, Madame Belash from Algeria, both of them companions of the liberation after the war, had already been illustrated by their bravery in the battles of Tunisia and Italy. Some, on the American cruiser, Dracker, before they landed, sang the Marseillaise. The patroller, patrollers took a minute in the night to kiss the sand from the beaches, the sand of France. Amongst them, Hubert Germain himself, landing on the coast, mentioned in his last days that he took the, the dirt and the sand together that he had desired so ardently to bring it to his face. Hundreds only knew France for just a few hours. Albert Torel from the Canadel, who fell the next day in the assault of the Pointe de la Sette with Mohamed Benbach, his men from the French army, were called François, Bojema, Harry, Pierre, Niakara. They came from Corsica, from the Poitou, from the Pacific, from Algeria, from Senegal, Morocco, and the Ardennes. Officers of the Empire or children of the Sahara, children of Casamance or Madagascar. They were not from the same generation. They did not have the same religion. They did not come from the same conditions. And yet, they were the army of the nation. The most colored and fervent army. For their chiefs, they had been through Monte Cassino, through Libya. Young hearts full of enthusiasm. The volunteers of 1792, soldiers like those of the year two, of the Act Two of the Liberation of the Country, convinced that when it comes to defending the vital interests of the nation, all of those who feel French must be together. And on the 16th of August, because our American allies wished to leave them the honor of reconquering their fatherland, they moved to Toulon, to Marseille, that Hitler had ordered to be defended until the very last bullet. Open the door, 
It's the African army. And the doors of liberty opened. With the batteries in Mauvin, conquered in the road of Yer. That's when the villages in Gabo, thanks to the tirailleurs from Senegal, during a ferocious battle with knives, with daggers, in Toulon, that the Germans had ordered to be held after a siege of a week led by the Algerian and Senegalese tirailleurs joined by the resistance from Toulon. Marseille, surrounded by its cliffs, where the Gommiers and the Tabor rousted the Germans. These doors that the French army went through full of a, following the audacity of General Montsabert, Marseille, faithful to their spirit of resistance, rose up against the occupier and was liberated when the last Germans surrendered their weapons. With one month ahead of plans, it was near Autun in Burgundy on the 12th of September that an officer of the 2nd Armored Division of General Leclerc shook the hand of the General Brosse's Fran free French troops. The first were from the north, had landed in Normandy. The seconds had come from the south and had landed in Provence on the French Riviera. The two armies met and shook hands in a gesture of brotherhood and swore to continue the battle until victory in the Ardennes, terrible, terrible battles the until the liberation of Strasbourg and beyond, until Nazi Germany surrendered, signed for France, 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 France by the General de Lattre de Tassigny on the 8th of May, 1945. And it was the same gesture of recognition and brotherhood and hope for the future that the nation today is commemorating these events. Here in the Boulouris necropolis, with 466 heroes buried here from among the thousands who landed here. The French, the Pieds Noirs from Algeria, from Morocco, from Tunisia, French from the overseas territories, from the West Indies to the Pacific, seconded by the French resistance, Americans, British, Canadians, who far from their countries died on the fields of Provence, on the beaches of the Mediterranean. Africans, the French soldiers from Africa, some of the veterans are here today, and I bow to you. The share of Africa in France is also a legacy. And I salute the presence of the President of Cameroon, of Central African Republic, of the Comoros, the Gabon, Togo. By your sides, my Lord, honoring Mon Monegasco and the Prime Minister of Morocco and the representatives from Côte d'Ivoire, Madagascar, Senegal, and young high school students. France does not forget the sacrifices of the Congolese, the Beninois, the peoples of Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and so many others. No. None of the memories of these men is forgotten. Their names must continue to be given to our streets, to our squares, to show their undying traces in our history. Eight decades later, coming back to Provence in the morning, in the blue hour, when the landing happened, there's this recognition of our brotherhood and hope. We will not forget their courage. And as 
president just reminded us, it's the importance of never giving up on our values and our battles, the battles for international rights, the refusal of any double standards, a willingness to defend everywhere the right of people for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the wish for a world with more balanced and fairer institutions. This message of hope, which you have provided us with, is the hope on this 15th of August and the universal victory of the rule of law and peace, brotherhood for the peoples of the world, fighting for their liberty and the right to choose their own destiny. This is the indefectible recognition for the heroes of the 15th of August, some of whom are here today. You all accomplished on that day and the following ones a work which was extremely perilous. And yet, they braved their fear paying them homage today is to salute these men who are our heroes. They climbed the cliffs of Cap Negre. They went beyond impossible, beyond suffering and risks. They did it, aware that they were fighting for a much greater cause, ready to sacrifice themselves so that France would be free. In A Midsummer Night's Dream and all the following nights, on their faces and the faces of our veterans, on the tombs of our heroes, in these pines, there is a wind blowing from Provence. This wind is that of sacrifice, willingness, unity. It makes the impossible possible, provides meaning for efforts, and paves the way for the nation. This wind of the 15th of August, which again makes us a free people that was also freed on that day by the armies of Africa. We will not forget. Vive la République. Vive la République. Vive la France. You were just listening uh, to the French uh, president speak there on the 80th uh, commemorations of the landings in Provence. The French president just uh, placing uh, a wreath uh, now. Uh, he will soon be honoring uh, the dead, and then there will be a minute of silence uh, before we have the French national anthem, which uh, is uh, sang by uh, members of the French army, the choir of the French army. Uh, France 24's chief foreign editor uh, was listening uh, to Macron's speech with me alongside uh, uh, our guest uh, Linda uh, here uh, in the studio. Uh, Rob, I want to ask you, because we had, before Emmanuel Macron spoke, we had uh, Paul Bia, the president of Cameroon, who was speaking, and he, uh, Paul Cameroon spoke about, yes, the sacrifices made by African forces 80 years ago, of course, from former French colonies, but he also referenced the fact that now, today, we do see a war taking place not far from here in France, and that, of course, a reference to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I mean, what he's talking about is continuing to fight for shared values, and it's a, you know, it's something that Macron also referred to. Uh, and le 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 I think we're just having the minute of silence now. Let's pause.
Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Contre nous de la tyrannie, les tonnes sanglants élevés, les tonnes sanglants élevés. Entendez-vous nous la campagne du Okay, you Monsieur le just uh, listening to uh, members of the choir of the French army sing the French uh, national anthem, uh, Marseillaise. I'd like to bring in Linda Erfieu, uh, journalist and author of uh, Forgotten, the untold story of D-Day's black heroes. Now, you heard there from the French president uh, speak about the sacrifices made uh, 80 years ago of uh, soldiers who fought. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of damage control that France needs to do, repairing in terms of uh, recognizing the sacrifices made by soldiers from for former colonies. Yes, this was a speech, a very moving speech from the French president, but there's still work that will need to be done in the years to come. France, in the last uh, few years, has tried to make amends to its uh, so-called colonial troops, the African troops, who, who uh, comprised two-thirds of the Free French forces that helped these operations, Operation Dragoon in Provence, uh, the push uh, to, to regain, recontrol France. But there is a long way to go. What we saw a number of years ago was a reinstatement of equal pensions uh, for, the, for these veterans. In uh, 2020, uh, we saw streets and, and, and plazas named after, renamed after some of the African, uh, African troops. But don't forget the loss. I mean, simply the Senegalese, uh, when France fell, there were 17,000 uh, Senegalese troops lost during the initial years of, um, of the war. And their sacrifice uh, cannot be underestimated. There were massacres of colonial troops uh, by Germans who took them prisoner. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to take quite a long time, I think, uh, in a commemoration such as these, where in the collective memory, we can be told what uh, these troops contributed. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, how there were uh, of course, a lot, the, the role uh, the African soldiers played in, in liberating France was uh, important, but there was a concerted effort to keep that out uh, of, of uh, the history books, uh, in a sense, even in photographs as well. Why, why, why is that? Why, 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 do you, why was that? The, the people recording history wanted a particular history recorded. So for the French, uh, for uh, General de Gaulle. This was to have a white uh, successor um, force sh to be shown to the public. So in the liberation of Paris, it was very hard for the French to get uh, a fully white uh, troops of soldiers uh, in, in Paris because they, they weren't there. The majority of those troops were, were black. They were African troops. And so... But I'm just thinking, if we're, if we're making comparisons to the United States, at this point in the United States, we, of course, had seg segregation, which was still mm -hmm. uh, in effect. But France didn't have that, so... Yeah, France didn't have segregation. And in fact, France treated African-American troops quite well, the French, the French mm. people, mm. in World War I and World War II. Mm. Uh, France has always been a haven for African-Americans escaping racism and discrimination. Like we've had singers come here as well. Exactly, right. Josephine Baker mm. uh, was feted by the French. Um, American, American singer uh, worked for the resistance in France. And 
know, we remember these contributions, but it's quite different when we talk about France's relation mm. with colonial soldiers mm. who were conscripted, many of them. There were some volunteers, but these were conscripts who were forced to fight mm. and then who were denied the credit, the glory, the financial uh, rewards mm. by well, a pension. Something that wasn't mentioned, incidentally, in any of those speeches today, that they were in the large, large part, forced to fight, as you say, conscripts. conscripts. Exactly. Yeah. And they fought with bravery. And mm. as I said, it was to their advantage because if they were captured by the Germans, it was horrific. But you have to think also they were fighting for democracy. They were fighting for the freedom of, of other people, of yeah. people outside of their country. The same as the African Americans who were second class citizens in their own country mm. fought with bravery. Um, and fought with courage. It's interesting, they were fighting for things that they didn't, themselves didn't have. Exactly, and this was not lost on the African Americans, and this was not lost on the Africans, and it's not lost on, on um, Africans today who talk about how well received the African Americans are, even today in France, and how their reception is not quite the same. Interesting point there. Uh, Rob, uh, let's talk about uh, something, because we did touch about uh, upon this uh, earlier when we spoke about uh, values and defending freedoms, uh, which yeah. Paul Bia was speaking about, because one of the, uh, the difficulties uh, France has had uh, on the African continent <coughs> in the past few years is, of course, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there has been this jostling of influence, if you will, between Western powers, which includes France and Russia, and it's not been an easy fight. No, well, we see now an increased presence of uh, Russian soldiers, not official Russian soldiers, but uh, mercenaries from what used to be the Wagner Group fighting in Mali, fighting the Central African Republic mm. uh, and elsewhere, even as far afield as Sudan. Uh, and you know, when it was interesting that when uh, the Cameroonian president was speaking about values, you know. I have the back of my mind, yes, you know, but this is a time when the values that you're talking about, and Macron started talking pretty much the same vein, this is a time when the values that you're talking about are to some extent being rejected by governments across, in particular, the Sahel region mm. of, of Africa, which the French fought for for so long. Mm. Uh, until very recently, they had, they had troops fighting in the Sahel, now been withdrawn because... Uh, we have governments that have rejected democracy in Mali, in Niger, Burkina Faso, where we now have authoritarian uh, military rule. Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, the Western countries, including France and the United States, have had a tricky time dealing with uh, how... Absolutely. Do... And they're, they're trying now to think, how can they readdress the balance? How can they ensure that what, that what we've been seeing in the Sahel doesn't spread to countries like Cameroon, uh, Senegal... Uh, okay, they, they, sorry to cut you up there. We had the fly past, uh, which just went by uh, in uh, the south of France, marking the end uh, to uh, the commemorations here, 80 years uh, since the landing in uh, Provence, otherwise known as Operation uh, Dragoon. Uh, sorry, Rob, I, I cut you off. No, no, I was, I was just finishing what I was saying there. You know, there, there is this concern. That there is a wave now uh, of uh, states being democratic governments loosely speaking, mm. being replaced by authoritarian military rule. And there is a concern that it hasn't reached the end yet, that this could spread beyond uh, the Sahel into West Africa, into countries like Cameroon, Ivory Coast, Senegal, uh, you know, where democracy is under challenge, no question about it. That, the, you know, the, 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 there is a threat. There's, there's a threat uh, in... in, in all, pretty much uh, many countries in the world, including in, in, here in Europe, the United yes, States, course, dem yeah. democracy is under threat. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Rob Parsons there. And I'd like to thank uh, Linda, a journalist and a photographer uh, who joined us for this uh, special edition. That's it for me. Thank you very much for watching.